Good evening, I guess I should say, from uh, cold New Jersey. This is the temperature of the climate uh, in which I grew up. Actually, a bit colder and wetter than even this one, but I'm now acclimated to a much drier, warmer climate. So I've got a sweater on, even though we're uh, in the house. Thanks for joining us. Um, I have no idea who you are. I'm looking at a little green dot on my uh, notebook, my laptop, and that's the webcam. And so beyond that, I have no idea who you are, but you're welcome. And we're certainly glad that you're here. One thing we do know is that we share a lot in common. And that's why we're here talking about this particular story that we reference in English as a gospel or good news. It's good news because it's what God has to tell us about how he is dealing with an issue. And maybe I, before we actually read um, a couple of verses together and I, I share with you what I've been thinking about, I, I could just give you a top line um, understanding of this. I'd like to remind ourselves from a, a bird's eye view, if you will, but what this whole message and what this whole story is, is really all about. Because what it has to do with is something that went wrong. We own the responsibility for that. It's called sin. It's called disobedience. It's called God creating man in the Genesis story uh, in his own image, after his own likeness, and wanting to really partner with him in what he was doing. He actually gave him dominion over the kingdoms, if you would, uh, of the animal kingdom, over this world, and made him stewards. And instead of kind of getting in line with what God's plan was, uh, we don't know all the details, but it seems that our first parents, if you will, decided that maybe they would have their own kingdom. And so they decided to set aside what it was that God had for them. It's referenced as disobedience. It's referenced as the entrance of sin. When instead of trusting and believing the communicated message of God to us, we rejected that message in view of greater aspirations or aspirations that we thought would make us more like God. And it actually has worked out to be the complete opposite. We have now seen the, the most wretched side of our humanity. We live in a world that's plagued by this, and we, we can follow the human story and all of its um, ugliness at times. You know, there are good points and bright spots, and we thank God for good neighbors. But you know and I know that there are issues in our lives with which we wrestle. There are struggles that we face that we don't know how to resolve. There are personal problems that we have in our relationships, spiritually with God and even with each other. And at the root of all of these problems is sin. The only person that can deal with that problem is God himself. And so God is really in the, in the business of reorganizing, of restoring, of recreating this. There's a new creation. So God is, is moving towards something that is big and beautiful. The fulcrum point, the anchor point for all of that is the death of Jesus Christ. And so the way that God makes provision for what he is wanting to do is by God himself becoming man. And we just celebrated Christmas, uh, the incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us. And we read the beautiful story of how God comes as a babe and is raised in a horrible little place called Nazareth. Uh, uh, he's born a king and yet he lives as a pauper. And we see his life and there's a beautiful, beautiful story to be told of what Jesus begins to do. But ultimately he goes to a cross and it is there where he sacrifices himself. He becomes the answer for our problem. He, by shedding his blood and giving his life, makes a provision for us to be able to be in relationship with God and become part of this new creation. And what God does in salvation, in this good news message, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us that those that are then placed in Christ, that welcome him, that receive him, that trust him, that come by faith to believe the good news that he shares, they are people that God begins this new creation and they are new creation the, the ultimate consummation of that will be seen in a coming day when jesus christ himself will return but now we see it in the lives of those that have been touched by the power of god and have had their lives changed now they're in the process of transformation because christians and believers aren't perfect but they have received life they've been born spiritually born from above and they see now they see the kingdom of god they see what god is doing and we partner with him again in moving this thing forward that's kind of a little bit now that's on a on a top line level what this gospel message is all about but that's so important because i want to to think with you tonight about the 
the, the, the essence of all of this has to do with believing the message that God himself gives via Jesus Christ. It, it means resting uh, on what he says or giving him the credit for speaking the truth, recognizing who he is as king, as Lord, as savior, and recognizing who, who we are as people that have, have gone astray. We, we have sinned. We have, we have really rebelled against God. We have left or abandoned the original purposes given to us. And we have, in, in, uh, in symbolic language, we have tried to create our own little kingdoms. We're doing our own little thing. We're not all too concerned about God or his kingdom. And the message of the gospel is that there's a way for you to be brought into this. But it starts by believing that Jesus is really who he said he was, that he really did do what he said he did, and that I am really who he says I am, a sinner in need of a savior. And so I, I want to just read a couple of verses. I want to talk to you about Peter. Um, I, I, I love the story of Peter. But Peter, when later in his life, he writes a, uh, a letter and um, here's what he says in this letter. Uh, we call it in our Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1. And at, at the start of this letter in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, mercy he has caused us to be born anew, born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the death and the burial, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ is at the heart of all of this because the fact that he is resurrected gives strength to this message. It gives assurance to this message. It says that the new creation, he is the first fruits of it all and it has begun with Jesus and it now can flow out to you. So we have been born again to a living hope via the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, he says, here's how we get at this at the end of this chapter. He says this in verse Number 23, since you have been born again, he's speaking to people that are Jesus followers, they are disciples, they are Christians. And he says this, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of something that is imperishable. Now, he's referencing back to those that had uh, hoped to have attained something by virtue of gold or silver or other means. But he says this, you have been born again by something that is imperishable. And he says, this is what it was through. It was through the living and the abiding word of God. And he says, and they had no time or attention for the Lord Jesus. But Jesus, as he speaks to everybody, to a mixed multitude, he often quoted this line. He says, if you've got ears, listen, pay close attention to what I'm going to say. One of the people that would have listened to the Lord Jesus was this man named Simon Peter. Now, Simon was a fisherman, uh, grew up in Capernaum, um, but he would have likely been a regular attender in the synagogue. And in the synagogue, they would have heard different messages constantly. Now, when the Lord Jesus began his public ministry, he began to visit all of these synagogues and he began to preach and he preached powerfully. He gave messages that were revolutionary. He told things to these people they had never heard before, and he did it in ways that with signs that backed up and supported who he said he was. When you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will come across the miracles of Jesus, and you will come across the stories and the parables of the Lord Jesus. When you see his miracles, they beg us to ask this question. They beg us to say, who is he? Who is this man? Is he really who he says he is? And when we read the parables, it begs us to ask this question. Who am I? Where do I fit in this story? Where do I fit in relationship with him? And so the Lord Jesus began and he, he came out and as he begins his public ministry, he's baptized. He is then um, goes into the wilderness and he is tempted uh, of, of Satan himself. He comes out of this and he begins his public ministry ministry right away. And as he begins his public ministry, he does it by quoting the words of Isaiah. He says this, to those that are living in darkness, he says, under the shadow of death, a great light has appeared. And he begins to announce something. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. He says this, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent. You've got to change your way of thinking. Repent for the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of, uh, of God, the kingdom of heaven are the same thing. They're used interchangeably. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 23, just a little, just a little bit later, uh, Matthew records for us. He says this, and he went throughout all Galilee, 
teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So what was this gospel of the kingdom? What is this good news that Jesus began to preach? Well, in essence, here was the good news. The king has come. I am the king. The kingdom of God has come near to you. There is a change that has been anticipated by Israel, recorded through the prophets, anchored in their hearts as the hope of Israel. It has come. It has arrived. And as he gives this message of restoring that which is right, remember, he's speaking to people that were living under 50 years of Roman oppression. These were people who had seen their taxes go up. These are people that were unable to keep their own homesteads, their own lands. And they would have had to sell these things off just to pay their taxes. They would have seen the, the, the imperial Romans come in and take up their properties and live on their territories. They would have seen the soldiers on every corner, the checkpoints. Their life had become a burden. They were losing their very national identity, and they longed for a kingdom. They longed for Jesus, for God to become king again. But when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to deal with a problem that, uh, that, that faces more than just Israel, faces the entire world. But he's going to have to have these people believe that he is who he says he is. Now, that was the problem. Not everybody believed that he was who he said he was. Not everybody believed his word. Not everybody had confidence in what he said. But there was one guy, there was many people actually, that did believe in what he said. The Lord Jesus came alongside of two people that were fishing one day. This is Peter and Andrew, and they're on the side of the, uh, the lake. And in Luke chapter five, um, it just reads like this. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to push out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and he continues to teach the people. What did he teach the people? The gospel of the kingdom. Now, this was different because the kingdom was a reversal of what they anticipated. It wasn't what they had hoped for. They wanted somebody to come in, kick the Romans out, get rid of the sinners, get rid of the publicans, get rid of everything that was wrong, that was bad, bring righteousness and order, do it with a heavy hand. Let's rise up with power. And suddenly we see Jesus Christ coming and it's not at all what they anticipated. His kingdom was actually very different. And he says that he's teaching the people from Simon's boat, from Peter's boat. Now, Peter has to sit there and listen. He has to maneuver the boat and keep it still in the waters as Jesus is preaching and his voice is traveling over the water to the people on the land. After he finishes speaking in verse five, he says, um, or verse four, he says to Simon, to Peter, Peter, uh, put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, uh, we toiled all night and, and took nothing. Peter's really saying, in fact, the word that Peter uses when he says master, it's almost like you'd say, like, uh, this is this is kind of crazy. Um, like, you know what, I, boss, like, you, you really want us to go out and do this? It's like it, it almost has resident in it a bit of in, in, uh, incredulidad, I want to say. I forget the word in English. But um, he doesn't believe him, really. But he's, but he's just what he says. At your word. Peter must have heard something in the synagogue. He must have heard the message of Jesus. He must have seen the miracles of the Lord Jesus and believed that this man, there's something different about him. This is just no normal prophet or teacher. There's something unique. Who he claims to be, he must very well be that particular person. So Peter says, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come help them, and they came and filled the boat so that they began to sink. But when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. Also, so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. So here is Peter. 
And Peter is being challenged to ask this question. Who is this? So Peter is getting one lesson, and the lesson comes through extremely clear at the outset of Peter's interactions, personal interactions with Jesus of Nazareth. It's this. What you say matters. There's a couple of lessons that Peter learns in this one, and I want us to learn this lesson tonight. What Jesus ultimately says is what really counts. He speaks with authority. He speaks with power because he is who he said he was. He is the son of God. He is God that was manifest in flesh. He is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And Peter understands this. His word has meaning. His word holds weight. But Peter understands this. This one who's speaking, he is now Lord. Because it changes in Peter's response to him. Later on, he says, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. At the start, Peter's just kind of using an expression that colloquially we could call it just saying, hey, boss, I don't know. You want me to? Uh, I'm not sure. Later, Peter is humble. Peter is broken. Peter recognizes who this man is, and he calls him exactly who he is. He calls him Lord. Peter understands that what Jesus says matters. He understands who Jesus is. He is Lord. And Peter understands who he is. He says, you need to stay away from me. For I am a sinful man. And yet this is exactly the people for whom the Lord Jesus had come. Jesus takes him and he envelops him and he welcomes him. In fact, in the very next chapter, the Lord Jesus is going to say to people that criticized and ridiculed Jesus for spending time with the sinful, the outcast, the people that were the, the dirty end of society. And Jesus says to them, uh, sick people need a doctor. Healthy people don't go to doctors. I did not come to call people who consider themselves to be righteous. I, I came to call sinners to repentance. And so the Lord Jesus makes clear in his teaching the exact people he has come to call. People that recognize that they have a problem. Now, the Lord Jesus is one that has identified that we all suffer from a problem. He has come to seek and to save those that are lost. He has identified the problem to the, the most righteous element of society. He says at one point in John chapter 8, he says, I told you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The Lord Jesus identified the root issue with all of us, that we are sinners. And he says, unless you come to believe that I am who I say I am, you're going to die that way. You're going to die with this problem of your sin. So the question is, are you willing and able? Well, you're able. Huh. The question is, are you willing to believe that he is who he says he is? That means that he is king, that he has a kingdom. That means he is Lord. That means he has a right to be obeyed. That means that I'm wrong. That means I need to repent. That means I need to come to the only one who can rescue and can save me. You see, there's another incident in Peter's life where he learned the value of the word of Jesus. This is found actually in Matthew chapter 14, and I won't take the time to read it, but it was one of those days that the Lord Jesus had just fed a great multitude of people, 5,000 men plus women and children, a massive multitude of people. They were so impressed with the Lord Jesus that they kind of decided we'd like to have him for king. Now, they didn't know in the true sense of the word that Jesus is king, but they want to actually take him by force and make him king according to their mindset of what the king was going to do, which was get rid of the Romans right now, bring back control, give us our, our, our power back. They didn't know that his kingdom was of a very different nature. The Lord Jesus escapes from them. He goes away, goes with the mountain to pray. He sends his disciples across the lake in a boat. A great storm comes up. They're in the midst of the waves, the wind. They're battling. They're actually perhaps even fearing for their lives. And Jesus comes to them walking on the water. And in this in this story in, in Matthew chapter 14, as the Lord Jesus comes to them, they are startled because they literally believe they have seen a ghost. And Jesus speaks to them. Here's what he says in verse 27. He says, take heart. It's me. It's I. Don't be afraid. Now, here comes Peter again. Remember the lessons we're learning. Who is he? Who am I? And what's the value of what he says? And believe in what he says, what does it do for me? Peter says to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. If it's really you, if you are who you say you are, 
Now, Peter's already learned this lesson in a boat. As the Lord Jesus says, put your nets out to see if there's any fish. And Peter's saying, hey, I'm a fisherman. <laughs> I know there's no fish here. But to their greatest surprise, the nets are so filled with fish that they begin to break. Peter knows that this man is somebody. But now comes another test for Peter. And Peter says to him, if you are who you say you are, tell me to come. Because based on your word, I will respond. Let me ask you right this at this juncture. Will you respond to an invitation from Christ? Will you respond to the word of Jesus to you? Because that's what matters. What he says matters. The Lord Jesus gives to Peter a single word. He just says to him, come. Instantaneously, Peter does what no other fisherman in his right mind would have done. He picks up one foot, one leg, throws it over the side of that boat, and he begins to step out into the water. And he walks on water. Nobody's ever done it before or since. And he walks on water towards the Lord Jesus. He responded to the invitation from Jesus himself. He sees the wind, the waves. He begins to sink. And he cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And immediately, instantaneously, Jesus grabs him, takes him by the hand. Says, why did you doubt me? You have little faith. And he saves him and he rescues him. And they're back in the boat and they get to the other side. I want you to think of that story for a minute in the life of Peter. Peter came to learn again that what the Lord Jesus says is what really matters. Jesus is who he says he is. And I am dependent upon him because I'm a sinner. I'm a sinful man. Do you know, to bring this into the terminology and the language, and the likelihood is we're speaking to people that are some way familiar with the, with the way we normally um, communicate this good news of the gospel, but our need to respond as lost sinners to a Savior who gave his life and shed his blood at the cross so that we could be welcomed into his presence. Do you believe the message that he says? And when would a person be saved in that particular story? Is it when he's sinking and he's falling and he cries out, Lord, save me? Or is it when Peter responds to the Lord Jesus, to his invitation, come? Do you know, Peter demonstrated what every one of us need to demonstrate. The moment his foot left the inside of that boat and went over the side of it. He demonstrated a response in faith to an invitation. The Bible says that by grace you are saved through faith. It is God's goodness. It is his free gift because we can do nothing of our own accord. It is through faith. It is through believing what he says. Jesus says that himself in John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one that believes me, the one that believes him that sent me, hears my word and believes the one that sent me has everlasting life. So it's a response to his word. Peter responds to the invitation of Jesus. So I, I want to ask you tonight. Do you have peace with God? Do you have a settled relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have confidence before him that you have been welcomed and received by him? See, because your level of confidence will not depend on how well you have believed or what kind of feelings you were able to generate or whether or not you did it at the right time, the right way, with the right verse. No, it will simply respond to whether or depend upon whether or not you have responded to his invitation. You Come to him. Well, I said, how do I come? How do I come to him? Because for Peter, it was quite evident. It was like step out of the boat. And if I was there that night, I would have stepped out of the boat, you may say. But this is spiritual now. He says, all those that are burdened, that are heavy laden in Matthew 11, you come to me and I will give you rest. Okay, I want to come. How do I come? By virtue of what do I come? You see, this is what Jesus Christ has done. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he will be saved. And so coming to the Lord Jesus is, first of all, recognizing who he is. Give him the credit for having told the truth about who he is. He is the son of God from heaven. He is God manifest in flesh. He is Lord. He is the savior of sinners. He is king. And this is his kingdom. It is recognizing who he is. And it is acknowledging that by simply thanking him for what he has done for me. You see, the night that God saved me, I simply came to this simple understanding. 
Jesus Christ had made provision for my greatest need. And I could either believe him and be happy about that, or I could struggle on and worry about it and try to generate something and, and go through life dealing with the worst manifestations of my sinfulness. But I trusted Jesus. I said, you know what? He is who he said he is. He will do what he said he has done, what he will do still with me and what he has done at the cross. He is my savior. And I welcomed him and he received me and he has made me his own. And that's what it means to come to the Lord Jesus. It means to understand who he is, who I am, and to believe what he says, to believe the message. You, 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 you probably acknowledge that to him by thanking him for the truth of it. That's one great way to do that. Peter says, as he writes his letter at the end, that we are born again by the word of God. You see, the way God communicates to us now is through his word. He tells us in his word what truth is. And we can respond to that truth. Our heart responds to that truth. He then begins to do a work in us that changes us and transforms us. We are given life instantaneously, salvation in a moment, in an instant, but a transformation that takes a lifetime to see completed. But once he begins that, he never backs off from it. He never moves away from it. He continuously pushes forward, implementing changes, renovating the new home in which he dwells. That is the beautiful truth of the good news of the gospel, of what it means to be part of the family of God. It means I understand who Jesus is. I accept who I am. I believe the record God has given concerning his son. Jesus himself said, if you don't believe that I am who I said I am, John 8, 24, you will die in your sins. The only way to have your sins dealt with is by believing that he is who he said he was. And that's why the Lord Jesus told story after story of people. He often told them in parables, people that some believed and some didn't. Some welcomed him, some rejected him. Some were indifferent, some were really unable to decide, they felt. But there were those with glad hearts that welcomed him and loved him and responded to him. I ask you tonight. What will your response be to the Son of God? Paul responded that he loved the Son of God because he knew this. The Son of God loved me, and he literally gave his life for me. He died in my stead. He died as my substitute. He made provision for me so that I could become what I could never, ever become of my own accord. And this is part of the restorative uh, uh, operation of God in this world. This is the new creation that is coming that takes place in the hearts of individuals that by faith come to trust Jesus Christ today. And God initiates that, that new thing in those people right away. And they begin to change. And before even the person sometimes realizes it, others realize the change because he begins to develop by his Holy spirit fruit in them, characteristics in them that they could never produce in themselves. This is the beauty of the good news of the gospel. This is what it means to come to trust Jesus, to know what it is to be at peace with God, to know your sins forgiven, to know Jesus as your savior, to own him as your king, to honor him as your Lord, and to await for him because he's coming back. That is the glad hope of every person who truly loves him. We love him because we know what he's done for us. I ask you tonight, could you take your side, your seat alongside Peter? Could you understand, like Peter knew, I'm a sinful man, I'm a sinful woman, I'm a sinful boy or a girl. Could you believe what he says? I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I've come to seek and to save those that are lost. That Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. That it is finished. Can you believe his words? Because if you can settle your heart, on what he says as being truthful, you can have the joy of experiencing, of knowing based on what he has said, that your sins are forgotten. You are part of the family of God and Jesus is yours. You are his. I trust that this will be your happy experience even tonight.